everybody, and welcome to the Satisfied God Podcast. Thanks for downloading this brand new episode. My name is Raven Bird. Let me just say uh, how much I appreciate you guys who are out there listening, sharing this, and liking and commenting on each episode. Thank you so much. That that does help me by letting me know that you're out there and that these podcasts are an encouragement to you. And thanks also, speaking of encouragement, for encouraging me by being um, willing to contribute to this podcast and to myself, uh, showing that you think it is of value. And again, that is beyond words. Um, I do not take that for for granted. And I appreciate what you guys do in that area as well. Thank you so much. This podcast is going to be a continuation of our look at Matthew chapter 5. It's actually going to end that for now. And then we'll move back into the Psalms 119 portion of these lessons. Uh, I think this lesson will be very helpful to you to see some of the things that are said in these verses that we cover and bring them into a clarity, a present truth instead of the futurization of it that has taken place, unfortunately, in the Christian world. I'm not going to belabor this very long. I want to get right into it. So let me just say, I hope you enjoy this. I hope it is an encouragement to you. And I hope that you guys have a very, very happy new year. Hopefully, uh, the year coming will be a little easier on us all than uh, 2020. And, um, you know, I know nothing in Christ changed, but it would be good to have our normal lives or whatever we call normal lives back um, to some degree. So happy new year, guys. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter five, uh, verse 12. Now, this is after what we've already talked about of blessed are you and men shall persecute you. Let me read verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, there's a lot here um, to get into. And what I'm, what I'm going to do eventually, I think, is take, take these sessions I've been doing and try to put them in some kind of a written form. Um, I say that about all the stuff like the Roman stuff Cindy's been helping me with, and I'm slowly going through chapter by chapter. But, um, you know, to get these things, because I think this, the Beatitudes is something that has been so misunderstood and that has been kind of a a launching pad for so many people to uh, make efforts and zealous works, the measurement of how valid their, you know, salvation is or how effectual it is. And I think what we've been looking at and the clarity of this that, you know, thank God the Lord is showing me some of it um, helps to understand that this is not something that he's instructing people how to live. It is him declaring the life that he is going to bestow to those who will come to him and the blessing and the blessedness of that uh, life and what that life uh, conveys. Just the presence of that life conveys everything. That's the thing I think we need to understand more, more than anything else. Just the presence of his life conveys all things. Just his presence. Mm-hmm. Nothing else is needed. And man, that's good news. I'm, I'm so happy to be able to say that without it sounding weird. false. Yeah, yeah, without it sounding yeah. weird. Uh, I used to say that to some degree, but then I'd always caveat by saying, but we've got to know this. We've got to understand. But I like what Spark said. 
in that thing, you know, don't worry about what you don't understand because we have a great big God yes. who is capable of filling the whole thing himself. Oh, uh, amen. And you know, that's, that's really a great statement. And if, if that would be uh, the thing that really carries us on as we pursue an understanding of the Lord, it would be great. And that's what I'm hoping that these teachings do as well. And, so, um, you know, what, what we're, what we're going to see is a lot of things, like I said, the reality of what he's bringing in, in his presence, the kingdom, the messianic, uh, expectation that he's bringing in and offering to these people that are before him. And we could keep going into Matthew five. I mean, we've talked about Matthew five, uh, many, many, many times, um, and we could, we could talk about that again forever, but let, I, I, I want to go here and then we'll go back to Psalms 119 for a little while. So be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for they persecuted the prophets that were before you. So again, he's bringing them back to saying these people, <coughs> if you come and receive what I am offering to you, because again, he is showing and in this he's demonstrating that what he is going to offer here is that which the prophets themselves declared and were persecuted for because they were declaring a reality beyond that very moment. And they were declaring a righteousness beyond that of the law. And you can see it. I mean, even Paul comes before Griffin and says, I'm declaring nothing except what Moses and the prophets said was going to come. And so he's telling them, here's your persecution is in line with the persecution of the prophets that were before you. The difference here that that's being made is that you have received the thing that those prophets actually prophesied of. You have received. And that's what he's talking about here is about great is your reward in heaven. That's what he's addressing. Um, in fact, what we've done, unfortunately, in the church is we've taken this phrase, great is your reward in heaven. And we've immediately projected that into the future, all the rewards and benefits. We say, well, that's going to happen one day. Mm -hmm. But this fortune, this future fortune or the blessings or the riches that he is speaking of here is exactly the same reward that he has already spoken about in this very chapter. The things that we've already talked about. Listen to these rewards. Great is your reward. Look at, look at it. Great. That means exceedingly great is your reward that is in heaven. <clears throat> now taking them to a realm in which this reward is actually received that which is above, not that which is below. So great, you have received an exceeding great reward, which is in heaven. And we're going to read a bunch of verses, a bunch of places throughout this lesson tonight that's going to confirm these things. I'm not just going to throw a bunch of stuff at you and not confirm it with, with, with other places. So uh, he's already talked about blessed are the poor. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. There's the reward. Uh, they that mourn shall be comforted. There's the reward. They shall inherit the earth or the land, the promised land. Remember, we talked about that. There is the reward that they have received, that which the prophet spoke of, but these people have now received it. The righteousness with which they shall be filled. There's the reward. Mm -hmm. The mercy that they shall obtain. There's the reward. Seeing or experiencing God, there's a reward. They shall be called the children of God. That's a reward that all the Jews thought that they already obtained just by natural lineage. But here's the reward you receive. Great is your reward. And those who are persecuted, yours is the kingdom of heaven again. 
again, this is the reward. Great is your reward, which is in heaven. It's not talking about something future. It's talking about the actual riches and benefit of coming to receive in this one the blessed hope, that which God had set as an expectation in the midst of his people. Great is your reward. He is not pushing it off into the future. He is standing there as the reward. Yes. Remember, yes. I am your shield, your, your, your great, exceedingly great reward. I'm sorry. He's standing there as the reward, as the covenant confirmed. That's what he came to do. And he stands there as that. Great is your reward, which is in heaven. And again, in heaven, we throw that off. Let's not do that. We'll, we'll read another verse that says the same thing. The reward here means a wage, something that is paid. You remember, I, th I did a I did a session or lessons a while back. I don't think I did it on these particular Zoom classes, but if you listen to the podcast or anything, um, I did this about the people who were hired by the man who had the vineyard. Yes. Oh yeah. And. Yeah. You know, he kept throughout the day going and hiring more people to tend this vineyard. And he had already agreed at the very start what the wage would be. Mm -hmm. And it came to the very end and the argument began to be, how do they get the same thing we do? How do they get the same wage as us? They, we've been here longer. We've worked harder. We were here first. See, that whole thing is about exactly what Jesus right now is talking about. The wage that was offered to the first, those who were first. Remember, Jesus says to the Jews first. It was theirs first by promise and prophecy. But those who came in, those that Jesus are, you know, those who come in at the end, the Gentiles, they receive the same thing. It doesn't matter how long you're in it, how long you've worked, how hard you labored. Everyone that comes to this one and receives the bidding to come into this vineyard receives the same thing. Yeah, that's right. There is, there is no greater wage that one man earns above another man because that wage is not earned. That wage is still a gift. Mm -hmm. Because you can't earn this wage. You can't earn this reward. Because when, when he came and found them, and that's another beautiful part of this picture, he went out and found them. They did not come to him asking if he was hiring. He came to them and bid them to come and work. And it said that they were idle, that they were out in the marketplace idle. And the word idle means actually barren. These people he come to were barren. They were absolutely, it was impossible for them to actually produce anything worthwhile. And he bid them to come. And again, the, the, the single wage that all men received, and they could murmur and complain and murmur and complain all they want. There's only one reward here. The church has made levels of reward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because we like levels of men. We like men to be at certain levels. The preacher's up here. The bishop's even higher than him. And here's the little lay people. I, I hate that word, the lay people. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, that's just a man-made, made-up word. Amen. So I can, you know, I can have a little more ascendancy over this person. There are no levels here. There is no... None of that. We don't earn this wage. We don't earn levels. Again, the wage. Here is the reward. This reward is great that we now have. And that's what he is telling them right now. Great is your reward that is in heaven. And the word great here actually means that which is that which has measure, weight, force, and continuance. The word continuance means it never ends. Really? I mean, that's great. That's great. That means you can't mess this up on your best day. 
Woo. That's how great this is. <laughs> you can't lessen the reward because of a thought or a deed. You can't lessen this. You didn't get it by merit. You don't keep it by merit. Thank you, Lord. Now, let's say the same thing here. Peter says the same thing that Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, just in a different way, okay? He's speaking to those who have now taken this offer to come into the kingdom, and he says the same thing. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, remember, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive merciful. There it is. His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. You hear the word continuance there? Mm -hmm. That fadeth not away, that is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, again, as church people do, we've taken that again, pushed that off into the future too. But look at the source of this. He starts this off telling you the source of what he's talking about. He hath begotten us. Begotten us. What is that? Born again. He has begotten us again. Through his abundant mercy, we are born again. And in that new birth, we have come to the living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is God's hope. If you follow me in Romans chapter 8, that is God's hope and the hope that he gave to Israel when he subjected them under the law. That is that hope fulfilled, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we are born again by this mercy of God, the abundant mercy of God, and that word abundant will be important in a moment, then we have received inwardly, in the soul, that hope fulfilled. Raven? That is, yes. I have a question. Um, yes, ma'am. When it says reserved, what does that mean? Yeah, reserved I'm going I'm, to I'm get to that in just okay. a minute. Yep. Okay. So when we are born again, we receive in our soul the thing that God subjected an entire creation for, the substance. That's why um, Colossians chapter 1 calls him Christ in you, the hope. Mm -hmm. of glory not a hope for some glory to come but the glory that was hoped for that's who he is in you that's this hope that we have in receiving the resurrected christ okay to an inheritance now this is the thing that he's talking about reward mm -hmm. it's an inheritance it's the same thing that is incorruptible that means it's not Corruption, there's no corruption to it. There's nothing natural to it. It is spirit. It is undefiled. It cannot be touched by human hands and defiled by man at all. Not even me or you. It fades not away. It does not fade away. It is continual and eternal. And it is reserved in heaven for you. It means what reserved there means. Let me look it up right here and I'll read it exactly for, for you. Okay. Um, go up here. It is that which is held fast, that is kept. It is like a fortress in a military. Gary, it's like a fortress. It's held in like it's fortressed in. It's walled in. Okay. You remember what he says about salvation? Thy walls shall be called salvation. Mm -hmm. To be reserved in heaven for you means that this thing is so united to the person of Christ. Let's say it that way, because we understand heaven and the person of Christ are one and the same. 
they are so united to his being that they are found there and found only there. There is a wall that basically keeps that reality from being touched or being stolen or being moved or being defiled in any way. It's like he keeps it under guard. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's held like it's under guard. It's, it is because he's just said, we are the ones kept. That's about the same word. It has the same root meaning. We are kept by the power of God and the salvation that this inheritance that we have is kept as well. We are kept in the same place where our salvation is kept. And that's in him, but it's not a place, it's a person. Is that right? Exactly. It's a person. That is yeah. him saying in Colossians, your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what it means to be reserved in heaven. It is so settled in a, one place and you are there anchored in the same place where your salvation is. You can't get moved from it if you want to. You know, it's really interesting how we take certain words and yep. we identify a certain meaning to those words where the scripture is totally different from no, that. Exactly you know, right. Reserve to I mean, me sounds like something future, you know, that right. we're, yeah. It's like prepared, yeah. what God has prepared. We've done the same thing with that word. But yet he says, we have been given the spirit that we may know the things that he has prepared. Why? Because they are already present within us. Yeah. It's not like we're going to know something in the future. It is, it's a reality. And he goes on here and he says, and, and this is the beautiful part, that we are kept, that, that also means garrisoned in and kept like within a wall by the power of God through faith unto salvation that is ready to be revealed. Now, here's the thing. Salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. And again, we've done the same thing. It's ready. It will be at some point revealed. That's how it's preached. Yeah. But okay. he's talking about a salvation that is ready. And the word to be revealed that we read in the King James and we think it's in the future tense. Actually. It's in the past tense. Yeah. You look it up. It is in the past tense. It is a salvation that is prepared, that is ready, be, having been revealed in this last time. Wow. In this time of the end, which is what the word last means, the end, the teleos, which, where Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end. The teleos, meaning the farthest point that can actually be reached. That's, that's what we come to when we're begotten again by God. We come to this salvation that is un, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, that is garrisoned by like a wall in heaven for us. What does that mean? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. That's where this reality is settled, secured, and unmoved. And the thing is, we are, if we are born of God, we are too settled, fixed, and unmoved in that place. That's the part that most people get a little iffy on, the unmovability of the thing. Because we've been taught so long that we can slip in and slip out of Jesus. Yeah. We've been yeah. taught so long that we can lose it, that we can backslide, quote unquote. I'm telling you, that's you. Don't, you cannot lose what you did not find. Amen. Okay, yeah, that's good. You had no power to get it, and you have no power to undo what God has done. The audacity of believing that we have that type of capability is what keeps us ignorant of a present reality, because we think we have that kind of control over things, and we don't. We really don't. Um, Raybon, is, yes, is it a past action with a present result? That's exactly what it, in the Aorist tense, that's what it has. It is a past occurrence 
with a present and continual result. That's what the word aorus actually means. That's the definition of it in the Greek. And you can, and here's another thing about the aorus tense, which again, this to be revealed, that's what, it, that's what it is. It is something God has revealed. You want another place that says that in the, almost the same words, Hebrews chapter one, verse one and two. In time past, God spake unto the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, or at the days of the end, he has spoken in his son. You know what that means? He has revealed all things that he spoke then in one person, in one man, in his son. He says the same thing there, okay? So it's, it's the exact same thing being said. So, yes, that's exactly what it is. And, again, with the aorist tense of these words, it also has an external viewpoint, which means, and, again, we get into the whole process that the church likes to preach because they like men to be in a process because what they like to do is be the ones that's guiding you in that process, right? Right. So they say, here's the step, here's the next step, here's the next step, and this is the result you're looking for or – Better yet, here's the result I'm looking for. If you reach that result, then I'll tell you the next step. <laughs> the aorist tense gives you an external viewpoint that has no reference to the ongoing condition of, or progress or process. The aorist looks at the end and the beginning as one complete matter. Does that sound like something Jesus might have said about himself? Mm -hmm. I am the beginning. Mm -hmm. I am the end. So when, when we talk about a salvation that has been revealed, guess where it's been revealed in the beginning and the end. It's not Amen. a process of it's going to start with Jesus and end with Jesus. No, if it started with Jesus, it's already ended with Jesus. It is Jesus. Okay. We don't have a linear thing here. We have a person in whom these realities are, are, are embodied, personified, mm -hmm. And give it. Uh, that's why we started in Psalms 119 like we did, to see it embodied the whole thing headed by the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last. That's what we're seeing. Uh, and, and I think as we go into pieces and parts of this Psalms 119, you're going to see it talk about what we've been reading in Matthew 5. You're going to see that. You're going to see Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 in it. It's just a beautiful study, and, and we'll get into it. But that's another aspect of the Aorist tense, not to get caught up in that and lose, lose where we want to go. Hmm. All right. Um, so the salvation ready. Now, I want, to, I want you to look at here also about the reward, the great reward that we have here in heavenly places, in Christ. Let's look at a, at a distinction of rewards. Jesus, again, in Matthew 5, but later in Matthew 5, into chapter 6, this is verse 45 of Matthew 5. Yes. He says that you may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you, what do you more than others? You see what he's doing here? He's showing them the shallowness of what we call being good Christians. <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. uh, how superficial it can be, but yet we find great reward in it. And he's saying, what reward is there really in it? If you salute your brother only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do this? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Now, perfection that he's talking about is far cry beyond superficiality. No. And that's what he's about to talk about. Take heed, you do not that you do not your alms, 
before men, men to be seen of them. That's where we want to be. We want to be seen. <laughs> In fact, that's how we have interpreted a lot of the words of the scripture and say, so that man can see your good works and worship your God in heaven and glorify your God. So they think, yeah, they want to see what I do. <laughs> but not only do they, I want them to see what I do, right? Well, Jesus here says, no, don't let that happen. That's not that's not what I'm after because again, that's superficial. Do, do not do this to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Therefore, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, guess what? They have their reward. You see the distinction between the reward in heaven and the reward of man? Problem is, we like that reward of men seeing what we do and, and, and giving us glory because of it. Matthew 6, 4 keeps going. That thine alms may be in secret, and your father which seeth in secret, he'll reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. I say unto you, they have their reward. Notice that the reward enjoyed by those who render external observations and these ceremonial obligations, they are seen of men. They have man's glory. That's the reward. But the reward that Jesus earlier speaks of in Matthew 5 is the reward of a heavenly and a spiritual substance that cannot be seen of men and a reward that will not garner you man's glory. See, we get the two confused because we still think that something of this spiritual substance will garner man's glory, or at least man will look at it and say, look how holy they are. I'm <laughs> telling you, they didn't do that with Jesus, let alone with us. And if they do look at it and say that, you know what they're doing? They're seeing something that does not actually represent the spiritual thing that they think it does. Because as we've talked about before, just as sin could not actually be seen by natural eyes, neither can righteousness. Amen. Sin was a much deeper thing. Sin was an internal matter. No external thing ever evidenced sin. Ever. You can go down to the ugliest thing you could imagine, and it did not evidence sin. And you can go to the most beautiful thing that you can ever think of. And that does not at all even represent righteousness, let alone perfectly manifest it. So these are the things. Which reward are we after? Because the reward we have is greater than that temporal reward that most Christians are after. <clears throat> The reward in heaven is something, that, again, undefiled, that will not decay, that has no corruptibility in it at all. And what that does mean is that it has nothing of you or me in it at all. It is all him. All him. So let's go and look at a couple of other things. Um, Colossians chapter 2 talks about this too. Colossians 2, verses 18 through 19. Let no man beguile you of what? Your reward. It's the same reward Jesus speaks of. This great reward in heaven. Because these are the ones he's telling, you are risen with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's above. This is the heavenly reward. And he's saying, don't let anyone beguile you of it. 
Amen. How will they beguile you of it? All of these externalities that will garner the praise of men, but not the praise of God. Voluntary humility, the worshiping of angels. Because in doing these things, they are intruding into things which they have seen. The word not is not actually there. They're They're intruding into those things which they have seen. What are the things that these people have seen? The externalities of the law. Because he's about to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Holy days, touch not, taste not, handle not. You can go circumcision, festivals, all of it. These are the things that they behold with their natural eyes and they think, I can enter into that and if I do it, then I'm righteous. Then I have this uh, reward. And he's saying, not at all. And if you are swayed to go to those things to find a reward, you have been beguiled of the reward you actually have. See, this is what we're talking about. And this reward also has to do with a crown that they used to give people when the race was won, the laurel leaf crown. When they ran a race, they would give them that. Mm-hmm. And what he's telling them is, guys, the race is won. Mm-hmm. The race is over. Mm-hmm. You have the crown on your head because you have Christ who is the head. Yeah. And if that is so, don't let any man take the crown off your head because the, the race is won. In fact, when Paul talks about, uh, I I don't know the exact place, and again, this has been another place where people get into it and they talk about asceticisms and all of that 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 Paul is addressing, you know, where he beats his body into submission, that all, all of these things. He says that we should run as those who desire to win the prize. But he tells them exactly what happens here. But only one wins the prize. (laughs) Okay, run to win the prize. But I'm telling you, there's only one who wins the prize. Right. (laughs) So what he tells them later, the next verse, the next couple of words says, if you look it up in a literal translation, I think it's Young's literal Weiss says it in a better way. He says, therefore, run as those who have won the race. Mm-hmm. That's how we that's how we run. That's how you run with patience, looking unto Jesus. That's it's it you're running from a place of victory already. You're running from an from a place of accomplishment instead of to a place where it's finally accomplished. That's why it's very important to understand these things as complete and real in Christ at the moment of new birth instead of finally we arrive there after being pulled through a knot hole backwards through whatever process God deems we need to go through. And for everybody, that process is different. Some people have to suffer more because they're hard headed. <laughs> right. Cause that's how it's been preached. No, the soul of man was brought into the same condition. Every soul, brought into the same condition in Christ because every soul had the same condition in Adam. Yeah. Amen. Same plan. Mm -hmm. It's it's the same all the way through the same way. Remember (laughs) that's the good news, man. I don't, I don't have to compare myself with you. You don't compare yourself with me. That's, that's out of the question. In fact, that's why Paul says it's unwise. Yeah, because it's not in accordance to the wisdom of God, because the wisdom of God says this of God. Are you in Christ Jesus who is made unto us wisdom? That is the heading of this wisdom from God, which is righteousness, sanctification and redemption. The wisdom of God is that it's not I, 
but Christ, Christ, so that no flesh can glory in his presence or glory where he is present. Hallelujah. And if he's present, then that's real in you right now. He has made unto you all spiritual things. He is your great reward in heaven. Amen. Thank you. Sir. Amen. Yeah. Now, let's, let's go on. Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Verse 24 through 27. Yeah. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He conceded the reproach of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Yeah. For he was looking, listen, listen to this, for he was looking unto the reward. Now notice the setting of these verses. This is important. The setting of these verses looks back at what we call, what they call the heroes of faith, right? These men who, who looked unto these things and realized that they are not for our time, but they are coming. coming. Mm -hmm. So he, he brings Moses into this and says, now he suffered these things because he understood that the reproach of Christ was greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Mm -hmm. But how could he do that? <laughs> he could do that because he was looking unto the reward. The, the same reward Jesus says, great is your reward. The same reward Paul saying, don't let them beguile you of it. Moses at that time in this testimonial picture was looking beyond that moment in Egypt and having the treasures of Egypt before him. He looked beyond that and says, Christ is a greater reward than this. Yes. Now here's the question. If he can look beyond it in just a testimonial way without actually being a recipient, recipient of it at that time and say, it's greater. I don't need this. I have him and he's enough. Why can't we who actually have him? in his fullness, present in the soul, yeah. why can't we? Well, there's a lot of reasons, I guess. I can't think of a good one, but I can think of a few because, again, we're not told that. Mm -hmm, that's true. You understand? People don't preach that. They don't tell you, you have this great reward they looked for. You have it. No, they still push that sucker right off into the future because they don't want to, they don't really know what to do with it because to them, he, Jesus doesn't seem like that great of a prize. Yes. Because again, when you talk about a reward that's in heaven, you not only speak of wealth and riches of a reward, He's actually defining the realm of that treasure too. He's saying it is heavenly. That means it is spiritual. That means it is unseen and unheard of. These are things that are unknown, unseeable, unknowable, unless he makes it known. But the reality of it, he's already made it so. Yes. And that's the beauty of, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to see it all, know it all, comprehend it all. I will do that as I grow in the knowledge of the Lord. But it's already accomplished entirely in my soul because he is present in my soul. The very thing that Moses here could reject the wealth of Egypt for because he looked forward to the reward, we have that. We have it. That's the beauty of this. So he goes on here. The same word about this reward that Moses looked forward to. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 34. Hebrews 10, 30. Hebrews 10, 34. Uh, 
and I'll read through 35 here. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have a you have in heaven a better and enduring. Remember that word continuance? Better and lasting. Lasting, continual, eternal, you know, substance. Again, don't put this into a place in the sky, in heaven, in heavenly places, in Christ. In fact, the testimony here in the very book of Hebrews is the holy of holies where one man stands in the sight of God. That's what he calls heaven itself. Mm -hmm. That always puzzled me too, right? That heaven, when we preach it, it's a bunch of people standing around the throne and having a worship service. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. they talk about it in the scripture, it's one man standing in the holy yeah. of holies. Right. That's heaven. <laughs> that's yeah. quite a difference. But that's real heaven. So knowing in yourself you have in heaven, this is that reward, the better and lasting enduring okay. substance. Therefore, yeah. cast not away your confidence. What confidence? Go back to the beginning of this chapter. The confidence that he has put away the first, established the second, that God has brought into us what the law could not perfect. He has brought that perfection into our soul. That's the very first part of this. Amen. Chapter. That's what he's talking about. That the God who made the promise has not lied to us, but has fulfilled it. That's what he says right before this. God is not a liar. So don't cast away your confidence in this reality because it has great recompense of reward. He's using the word recompense of reward to show the present reality based upon the testimonial picture, but he's showing them that to be a present reality in their soul. Let us not cast away our confidence in the presence and sufficiency of Christ to go look for a reward when we already have the great reward, the better and enduring substance. All right. So <clears throat> we'll move beyond that. We don't have to, we could stay there a long time, but there's a couple of things I want to look at before we stop. Um, let me see where we are in time. Uh, uh, hour, okay. I've already hit an hour. Sorry. There is a, when he, when he goes on here in Matthew 5, and I want to get into Psalms 119, but he talks about the salt of the earth, mm -hmm. the salt, and if the salt loses its savor. Let me just talk about this for a second. Salt is a preserving element right it it is that which keeps something from going from decaying putrefying and being corrupted and when he talks about that that's exactly what he's saying those of you who receive this reality this kingdom you are in this land that i came to you are those who will present a reality a righteousness a relationship with god that is free from the corruption and decay of humanity. That's what you will be. You will be those declaring. Let's not, let's not take these words and just walk around, you know, narcissistically saying, Hey, we're the light of the world. <laughs> you know, no, you are those who are proclaiming a reality that is beyond the putrefication of man, the decay and corruptivity of men. But if you lose your savor, again, he's talking about going back to something that has no reality to it, to let go of this reward. Go back to that. Stay in the law. Don't receive the end of the law, but stay there. Then you lose your savor. And if that's and if you lose your savor, you're good for nothing. A salt that has lost its savor, they would put it out in the pathways for men to trot on. That's what it was good for. And there's one commentary that I read here and I liked 
the kind of the metaphor that he used here. And so I'm going to read it. You know, I'm not big on metaphors, but I think this is pretty good. So he says um, <clears throat> that he uh, talks about the, the salt that was in that time, in that country at that time. And he says in Eastern countries, however, the salt that was used many times was impure, mingled with vegetable or earthly substances so that it might lose the whole of its saltiness and a considerable quantity of earthly matter would remain in it. This was good for nothing. The kind of salt is common still in that country. It's found in the earth in veins or layers. And when exposed to the sun and the rain, it loses saltiness entirely. Yeah. But one of the guys said here, uh, Mandrell was the uh, man he's quoting here. He said, <clears throat> When inspecting the veins of salt, he said, I broke a piece off of which that part was exposed to the elements. And though it had the spark and the particles of salt, it was sparkly when the light hit it. It looked just like salt. It was still pretty. <coughs> it had no saltiness at all. Hmm. He said, however, the inner part that was connected to the rock remained with its savor. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now to me, there's a metaphor, right? Yeah. <laughs> that which is joined to him. So what does it mean to lose its savor? See, we think to lose the savor means a process of backsliding, <laughs> you know, I did these bad things and the culmination, you know, the quanti quantity of bad things has now rendered me saltlessness, saltiness, no savor, right? No, what it means is being joined to the rock is the only way not to lose your saltiness. Being joined to him is the only way to not lose this which is the same thing as Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you continue in me, then fruit is automatic. <laughs> you don't have to worry, think about it, uh, sweat it. If you abide in me, just continue in me. What God wants done will be done in you because you are not the source of it. You are just joined to the source. So that's a beautiful thing to realize <coughs> that to be salty just means you're found in him having nothing of your own because it's that of your own, that which you call holiness and whatever, that is actually the definition of lose your savor. Now, here's the word, lose its savor. It's actually one word. Moreno, to become insipid, to be as a simpleton, to become a fool and to make foolish. That is, that is the word that he uses for losing its savor. It's 3471 in the uh, Strong Concordance. That's your reference number. Okay, 34. And when I saw that, <laughs> there was a couple of places that came, but most, you know, definitely came into my mind where Paul says, fools of Galatia, who has bewitched you? Why? Because these people who are trying to make you look beyond this union with Christ that is sufficient to circumcision and the festivals and holy days to try to find your righteousness. They have made you fools. They have made you lose your savor because they have caused you to step outside of the boundaries of the grace of God that has been given. Fools of Galatian. How does he define that? You are trying to perfect in the flesh what is already perfect in the spirit. Same thing. 
It is the same thing as the one who hears the words and doeth them not is likened to a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. Instead of the wise man that builds it upon what? The rock. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, just some beautiful things that I saw because he talks about a, and he talks about a, a city on a hill, the light from the city on a hill that cannot be hid. What hill you think he's talking about? Could it not be Mount Zion? Zion, yeah, we have come unto Zion. The hill from which I look unto the hills for our salvation. There's the hill, and a city that's on that hill cannot be hidden. It is a light. Indeed, it's a light because it is declaring the light has come. The day, the night has come to its conclusion, and the day star has arisen. And that's what he's addressing here in Matthew 5. And he continues on and continues on in this by saying, I didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it. Well, absolutely he did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely he did. So I've gone way beyond an hour, guys, and I don't want to belabor this too long. So I want to go to Psalms 119. And I'm just going to read the verses that we'll start at next time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll go from there. This will give you some time to look at them too. But Psalms 119, we're going to start in verse 10 in our next uh, session. Psalms 119, verse 10, I'll read through verse 20. With my whole heart. Now listen to the heart of this man again. We said it's about someone who loves the law, desires to do the law, wants, I mean, just has such respect and love and appreciation for God's commandments and the law of God. And yet in the very same breath cries out, help me to keep it. Help me to do it. Because mm. here's the, the desire for it. And we're going to talk about how is that desire fulfilled because this man who's crying knows he's not the one who has the power to fulfill it, but he knows he loves it and wants to see the, 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 the reality of it and wants to be, I mean, he, he gives his whole heart to it. So listen to these things. You hear both things here with my whole heart. Have I sought thee? Let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed are thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes, and with my lips have I declared thy judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as is in all riches. And I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes and I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto the judgment, thy judgments at all times. Now, again, that's where we'll be in our next time. But I want you to consider this and understand this psalm. What we're seeing here is how the desire to obey and perfectly accomplish what the commandments require. How the power or the means to perform that, how the, the desire and the power to perform it come together. Mm -hmm. Because you see that it's a prophecy. It's a prayer and a prophecy at the same time. Because again, it's headed by the Alpha and Omega, the Aleph and the Tav. That's the heading of it all. Amen. Love for the law, respect for its precepts never will automatically translate into the accomplishment of it. That's what we find out. The soul necessitated something deeper for the law and the precepts of God to actually be accomplished. It couldn't be accomplished by works. 
We're going to see how it's accomplished because it's right there. In this psalm, you see it in total. In these verses, you see it presented as well. So we'll we'll look at that the next time. I appreciate you guys being out there and listening and joining us for this. Thank you.